Everyone, this is Ross Raddy, and welcome to another episode of Fruit Talk. This is the podcast-style video that I do for you guys every Wednesday night at 9 o'clock Eastern, and I normally do this on my YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com slash Ross Raddy, but uh, this week, this is the first week we're actually going to be uploading this podcast to uh, to iTunes. So if you're watching on iTunes and you uh, found me through iTunes, welcome uh, to my channel and welcome to... Uh, Fruit Talk and myself, uh, the host, Ross Ratty. So in these videos, we love to talk about fruit and vegetables, uh, all things food. We're, I'm a big foodie, so I love really great food, and I love to make my own food. I love to uh, especially grow my own food. So here in Fruit Talk, we have found very, really interesting um, things that I've, you know, I've come across through my research and my passion for growing uh, fantastic food. You know, I've come across these interesting things, and that's what I'm going to share with you guys in this in this episode. So, uh, let's get into it here. The first thing I want to talk about is actually uh, I went to a fine dining restaurant, and it's nice to see what the chefs are doing compared to. Um, you know, as a grower myself, I have access and have a lot of friends that grow a lot of different things. You know, it's interesting to see the difference between what they are growing and what the chefs are creating out of that uh, out of that food. So, um, yeah, it was really great to see the other side of things. And I don't know, I don't get enough opportunities, I think, to go out to a fine dining restaurant. And what we're looking at here, if, for those of you who are on YouTube can see this, but we're looking at Harp and Crown's menu. And this is a restaurant in Philadelphia that I went to. Like I said, uh, fine dining, well, not fine dining, but high end restaurant um, that, you know, does small plate types of things, really puts the time and the consideration into what they're creating. You know, it's a work of art for them. Um, they use all kinds of incredible ingredients to create amazing food. Um, for people in the city of Philadelphia. So um, not that I'm promoting Harp and Crown, but this is where I was and I want to show you their menu to talk about some things that I uh, did eat or could have eaten and I think that's pretty interesting. Um, you know, I think there's some really interesting combinations of what they come up with here. You know, for example, uh, the heirloom beet here salad. You know, they've got honey with that. Um, I could imagine even putting some um, some kind of other fruit with it like grapes as an example we had a kabocha squash salad that uh, had cheese with it it was fantastic really crispy greens uh, there was some sliced up grapes as well as some homemade croutons so I've never had croutons like that before boy oh boy were they good but the most impressive thing in the salad actually was the kabocha squash and this is something we've talked about previously on fruit talk uh, I was considering growing kabocha squash myself and for those of you who have seen my garden plans video for 2019 you know that I actually decided against kabocha squash um, we're growing four different types of squash this year um, of course you gotta grow a spaghetti squash you gotta grow the um, the butternut squash and there was a few others that had come up recently that really sparked my interest and kombucha was one of them and why is that well we talked a lot about um, my climate and being here in Philadelphia we are in a humid subtropical climate um, we certainly get cold and we're probably more temperate obviously than subtropical but our climate kind of lines up pretty well with parts of China and parts of Japan so when I'm selecting different varieties and different crops that I'm thinking about growing you gotta obviously look at what they're doing in Japan and what they're doing in China and this is something that they grow over there I believe in Japan is kabocha squash and I'm really happy that I got to try it because it's always great guys if you decide to grow something you need to decide it's always well it's always better to taste it before you decide to grow it and obviously I'm not gonna have the uh, the skills that these chefs have right in preparing all these different things but I can certainly try and replicate this to the best of my ability I can see exactly what it is they're doing on the plate you know I took lots of pictures and then that way I can go back whenever I decide you know what I'm gonna roast this carrot and I'm gonna try to do it the way they did it you know or I'm gonna make a carrot puree because it was so good 
or I'm going to try to make this kabocha squash in the way that they did. What I will say about the kabocha squash, though, is that it was it was like cheese um, in the in the sense that it was like a pumpkin flavored cheese. It tasted a lot like a uh, a really hard, finely textured, finely grained cheese that blew me away. I really enjoy that texture. It was a bit dry, as some cheeses can be, and it was a bit, um, you know, it was a bit hard, but I think that really, to me, uh, resembles a fantastic cheese that I thoroughly enjoy. I know a lot of people like soft cheeses, like uh, types of brie, or, you know, cheeses similar to brie. I'm not a big fan of those. I like the, the harder style cheeses, and this one had, even though it wasn't a cheese, it had the perfect texture for a cheese. So I'm certainly going to be growing a kabocha squash. And you can see here at rareseeds.com, Baker Creek Nursery, as well as Johnny Seeds, I believe, also sells kabocha squash seeds as well. Um, I'm going to be picking up some seeds of this and growing it myself year after year. And there's, there's actually quite a few varieties out there. So I may at one point consider trying to do that if you go on fedcoseeds.com at fedco nursery um, we can get to that and you can see a whole bunch of different varieties that fedco is offering and one of them very specifically in the description here is talking about that dry texture that i was that i experienced um let me see if is it i think it's called thunder here yeah so uh, the Thunder Kabocha Squash. Uh, our taste testers greeted this Kabocha slash Buttercup uh, hybrid with thunderous applause. They they found the taste of this dry, sweet, flavorful, dense, thick flesh and lightning. And I certainly um, can kind of agree with that. It's more of a drier texture, really finely, uh, finely textured, and it's quite dense. So really an interesting thing that I think people ought to look into. Uh, let's move on now to Marion Berries. And we talked a little bit of, in last week's episode as we did the live stream video. We talked about uh, hybrid blackberries and hybrid raspberries. And one of the hybrid, or it's not technically a hybrid, I believe. It's more of a, um, I think it's more, maybe it is a hybrid. According to Stark Brothers Nursery here, it says a descendant of native blackberries, raspberries, and loganberries. I'm sure it's related, but I don't believe it's a, it's a hybrid. So... Essentially, this is a, a blackberry that a lot of people in the Pacific Northwest or even Oregon um, love this berry. It's very popular in Oregon. Um, and this one was, I think, bred. And some of them have been found and kind of cultivated throughout the years, but they've been breeding more of them, uh, a.k.a. this variety here called Black Diamond on Ray, Rain Tree Nursery. And you can see that um, this is a different one that's a bit, of a different flavor it's thornless has uh, increased cold hardiness and it's larger and a firmer berry so uh, quite interesting how they've been improving this and I had no idea that this was something a different classification I guess of blackberry that they have actually been trying to improve and usually when I look at um, new crops that I'm considering growing is that if people have been growing them and there's many varieties out there of this particular crop there's a lot of interest behind it it's definitely worth a look at right so this black diamond blackberry uh certainly is an improvement and certainly is going to be i think the variety that i'm going to choose to grow here in philadelphia and the whole difference i guess between the marion berry and the blackberry is a bit confusing to myself um a lot of times when nurseries or other people describe flavors, they're not always accurate or it's not always as obvious as you would like. You know, it's not, um, it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense until you eat it yourself. So that's what I'm going to have to do is pretty much grow this myself and eat it. But essentially what they're saying, a lot of people are saying is that the Marion Berry is a more complex blackberry. So... I'm interested to try it. I love blackberries. This one is a blackberry that will fruit on the the uh, the floricane crop, so you have to wait two years to get fruit off of it. But like my um, primocane blackberries, and in fact, you'll actually get fruit on it on the first year. So 
Um, you know, this is a little bit of a, of a different time of the year that this will be ripening and kind of will ripen in succession of my primacane blackberries. So um, we'll hope we'll hope we'll cross our fingers that this berry doesn't coincide with spotted wing drosophilia like my triple crown blackberries have in the past and we'll be able to grow this one um, it's going to be a bit of a challenge i think to protect this one from critters or the birds because this particular berry likes to grow along the ground and sprawl like your typical bramble uh, but blackberries are more erect same thing as raspberries and they are very easy to contain very easy to train and therefore very easy to protect so this one's going to be a bit of a challenge but if it's uh, worth it for the flavor then I'm going to grow it um, the next uh, thing I want to show you guys the next fruit I want to talk about is called an alpine strawberry and we've talked a lot about alpine strawberries on my channel I've done some taste tests between alpines and regular strawberries the alpine strawberry is your typical wild strawberry it's in incredibly good and I would describe it as having a wild strawberry flavor that's very different than your typical store-bought strawberry first off if you've never had a homegrown strawberry you don't know what you're missing it is unbelievable the difference between a store-bought strawberry and a homegrown strawberry is quite significant and what I will say about the Alpines is that they're very small, as you guys can see here on YouTube. They're about the size of your thumb. Uh, but the fact that they're so small kind of dissuades people away from growing them. The other thing that people usually don't like about them is that the green part, or the calyx, I believe it's called, on the top of the strawberry is completely missing. So. It would be nice as you know people like uh like us that are going to be home gardeners or are home gardeners that the the green part of it can just rip off very easily which is fantastic for us but it's not fantastic for the shipability of this particular fruit so that's why we never see it the flavor is incredible unrivaled way better than a homegrown strawberry but it just cannot ship well at all it doesn't store very well because the interior of the fruit gets exposed after you pick it so um, that's kind of it in a nutshell it's a very small strawberry with intense flavor that will blow you away you won't believe how intensely flavored of a berry flavor that you will get from a wild alpine strawberry and this particular variety here that I want to show you guys is called Ren de Valet and I'm not exactly sure if I pronounce that correctly sorry to all you guys who speak French but um, you know that's how we say it here in Philadelphia <laughs> but, but um, you know this is a variety here of Alpine that has getting high remarks and uh, high reviews from people that have trialed many varieties of Alpine so I'm personally very excited to try this particular strawberry and this particular variety so I've grown Alpines myself but uh, some of them vary in size and some of them vary in productivity so if I can find a alpine strawberry that I think might be able to outcompete a, a regular strawberry then I may consider growing many more alpine strawberries so this will be like a bit of a test we're gonna get some seeds here we're gonna grow the alpine strawberries out we're probably gonna start them relatively soon um, now that it is January we're probably gonna start them relatively soon probably grow them in about four inch size pots and we'll plant a few of these out in the yard see how well they do and if they do really well uh, compared to my other alpine strawberries we'll take out the other alpine strawberries if they beat out the or come close to the regular strawberries that I have such as Mara de Bois that's another French strawberry that I grow that is um, your typical regular yeah, it's, it's a bit smaller actually as well but the flavor on it is incredible it, it tastes like bubblegum um, a lot of people have actually described the alpines as having a bubblegum flavor um, it has that really wild berry wild alpine strawberry flavor to it Mara de Bois so um, to be able to find more of these strawberries that have that incredible flavor is something we ought to be looking into more of um, someone really ought to take Mara de Bois and breed that into a larger strawberry a more productive strawberry and you will get something 
incredible in the stores. I don't know why that hasn't been happening, but um, we ought to be considering more, 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 uh, more things about taste, guys. Right? That's kind of why we're watching this podcast, right? And that's why I'm doing this is to try to encourage you guys to try to th think about things in terms of taste rather than, you know, how big is the strawberry? So, um, yeah, this is the variety Ren de Valet is the the variety that I'm going to try and grow this year. Again, we're going to propagate this, see how it does, and uh, we'll see if we can potentially replicate these things, clone them by division, um, and spread them around the yard, and maybe even have a alpine strawberry patch in the future. Um, I know the chefs, by the way, really love these strawberries. So if you are uh, selling the chefs, this may be a really nice crop to grow. Um, and they'll probably pay a pretty penny for these things. The last thing I want to show you guys is a photo here of my persimmons. And this is some dried persimmons uh, or persimmons that I dried in the dehydrator. It's very simple to dry persimmons, guys. Um, I usually do what I, what I do is I cut them in um, horizontally in slices, kind of like deli meat. And I'll cut them quite thin. And the thinner you do it, the, the quicker uh, the dehydrator takes to fully dehydrate them but I do it in slices and put them on the dehydrator um, trays and they come out really well excuse me in thin slices it takes about six to eight hours for them to fully dehydrate it dehydrate in this form here uh, we have them in much bigger um, chunks and I think this is a different way of doing it but these were persimmons that were a bit more ripe that I wasn't going to be able to finish them by eating them fresh. So instead of wasting them, I cut them up into chunks and put them in the dehydrator and they came out incredible. Um, it doesn't seem to make a difference how you cut these guys up. If they are dried or even if you don't cut them up, you dehydrate them whole, they are unbelievable. So what I'm going to do next year is uh, with a lot of my persimmon crop, we're going to string them up kind of like a lot of Italian um, Italian people do. They string up peppers. A lot of people will string up other types of uh, vegetables and fruits and kind of get them to dehydrate that way. Put them in a cool, dry place, and uh, that way you'll have less chance of mold, and that dry air will hopefully over time dehydrate them very slowly, and you'll get uh, a really complex intensely flavored fruit that way and that's exactly what these persimmons are i mean they just absolutely blew me away if you're not growing persimmons i totally suggest you do they can be grown in just about anywhere in the united states um, they can be grown anywhere in the united states so um, you know grow some persimmons and this is that concludes our episode here of fruit talk so thank you everyone for watching and if you guys are interested in more things about fruit you obviously can follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And, of course, at YouTube as well. The same tag, at Ross Ratty. Um, also, if you're listening to this on iTunes, please go and rate this podcast uh, to let me know how you guys like it. Um, and if you're enjoying it, um, thank you so much. So take care, guys, and I'll talk to you all soon.